Welcome back, Algebra Express. We are in Maricheck 6.5. So we are continuing with what we have been doing with factoring. And instead of rewriting expressions, now we're going to throw an equal sign in there and talk about solving these as equations. And to review what does solving mean? So to solve something means to come up with a value for the variable that makes the original statement true. So we're looking to make original statement true. So if we have something like a times b equals zero, there is something we can say about either a or b. So if we have two things being multiplied to zero, the way that you get things to multiply to zero is by multiplying by zero. So either a is gonna be zero, Or if A is not zero, so if A is any other number, then B would have to be zero. <clears throat> so it could be that A is zero or B is zero. Zero times B will give us zero. Or what, A times zero will also give us zero. Or the other thing that could also sort of happen is they are both equal to zero. Zero times zero will also give us zero. So it is possible that both A and B are zero. So I know we're using different letters, but they can both be the same number. We can get the same value for a variable. Uh, so, and usually when we use the word in math or the or word in math, we mean this one or this one or both of them. It is the inclusive or typically when we say or in math. And so when we use or in everyday language, it is not always like a super uh, obvious which one we're using, right? Sometimes when we say or, you're like either shut up or get out of here, right? I mean to do one or the other, right? Is the either or which is exclusive. Doesn't mean that you do both, right? Okay, so and that, that comes from math, like math being an application of logic. Anytime like they use the word or in logic, they typically mean inclusive. Unless they say like the word exclusive, it's, it's it's kind of a weird thing. And it's like one of those things where our language is probably not quite so precise, but logic and math language is really precise and it has a really specific meaning. Uh, so we want to be able to solve this using that principle. So the way we're gonna sort of look at this is like, this is like, this thing is sort of like my A here. Like sort of like B. So I have these two terms have this thing times this thing is equal to zero. So I know either A is zero or B is zero, or it could be that both of them are zero. So the first thing I'm looking at here, and this is called the principle zero products. And this is what it's written out. That's the thing I just talked about. Uh, so we're applying it to this thing to solve it. So I know either A, which is X minus five is equal to zero. Or I know this thing that is B, which is two X plus one has to be equal to zero. So this is what the zero product is telling me. If I have a bunch of multiples, one of those things has to be equal to zero if this thing is equal to zero. So if I'm solving this, if I break this apart like this, so this originally started out probably as a quadratic. We've been doing enough factoring. This starts out as a quadratic. We break it up into these factors that are multiplied by each other. We set them equal to zero. We make sure they're set equal to zero. And then we can use a zero product rule. So this is x minus five is zero. And we can solve these things because now they are first order sort of linear equations, right? They're, they're not square things that are hard to solve. So this is a sort of first order uh, equation. So x is equal to, we add the five over is equal to minus one, we subtract over, and then we divide by two, so x is a minus one half. So I have two things here, I have an x equals five, 
and have an x equals a minus a half. <laughs> so I didn't say this, but I want to like jump back just to think back. This is zero principle, a zero zero product principle. Um, and so a times b equals zero gives us either a equals zero or b equals zero. Can we say anything about a and b like we can in this equation or in this principle? And the short answer is maybe circles of each other, right? But there is nothing that we can say really about these things in the the uh, in what a and b could equal. We cannot set like a and b equal to some cer certain number, right? We can solve for a or b. So for example, we've got one over b for this one, maybe. So we could rearrange this thing. We could rearrange these equations, right? But they're still going to have two variables in there. Like we're not going to get rid of a variable. Uh, and so there's this very certain, like there's this very special pro property about multiplying by zeros and equaling zeros and things of that nature that make this possible. So this does not work with any other number but zero. So I'm going to say that, make a point of it, and it might come up later, wink, wink, nod, nod. But it only works with zero. And so move all terms to one side to get the equation into the polynomial form equals zero. So that's why we're doing that first step. If it's equal to any other number, we can't do it. <laughs> this looks a little blurry. Can I fix this up a little bit? I guess not. Let's try. That might have made it worse. Okay, let's go on with it. <laughs> Move all terms to one side to get equation into polynomial form equals zero. Then we want to factor the polynomial. So hopefully you've been practicing your factoring. This should be the thing that you whiz through, hopefully. And then we said each factor equals zero and solve. So that is the zero product rule. Zero product rule that they're talking about right here. But we're setting this thing up. First things first is we want to set one side equal to zero. So there is a certain like, probably way that is easier to do it on this side. I want to do it through easiest way. So I'm going to move this 40 over. So if I subtract 40 from each side, I'm going to subtract 40 from each side. The equals, and if you have 40 minus 40, some people will drop things right here. The equals zero is an important thing to put. So we have 40 minus 40 is going to give us zero. Be sure to put this equal zero. Now we have something that looks like 15x squared minus x minus 40. So I might notice there is a, the first things first when we're factoring. So let, let's go first step first. We did the first step. We got it equal to zero. Now we want to factor. And the first step to factoring is that we look for a GCF or greatest common factor between everything. I'm seeing 15, 10, and 40. Like those are all multiples of five. So I just want to have five which is x squared minus two x zero. And another way to check that like you you picked out the GCF, you can look at these things and make sure there's no other common factors here. So we have a two and a three. That's a good indicator we picked out the GCF. And if you don't pick up the GCF, you can always pull out another factor and multiply these things together, right? It's still possible to salvage your work. It wasn't done in vain. <laughs> uh, so now we're looking at this thing. And now this is the factoring that we've been practicing. And now things that add to minus two. And now you want to find these factors. <clears throat> and so we've done th two, two or three se sections over this. <laughs> Uh, so I want to move a little quicker, quickly through this. Before this, with this x being negative, so you should have practiced these. You should practice this. Make sure you have these things down. 
<clears throat> we're gonna go back. We're gonna break this middle thing up. We have This is equal to zero. I want a grouping factor, a grouping factor. Minus two, and I have an x minus two. Give me zero. If you want, you can bring down that five. And my three factors are five. I have a three x plus four, and I have a x minus two. I have this thing fully factored. So step one was to set one side equal to zero. Step two was to fully factor this thing. Step three is the thing we just learned. So you might be looking at this. Being five equals, no. So there's no way your five is gonna equal zero. That's not gonna happen. So if you have a constant over here, to be honest, you don't really have to worry about it. But if there is a variable over here, you do have to account for it. So we just pulled out a constant. It's not a, it's not, five is never going to be equal to zero. So we don't have to worry about that factor being equal to zero. But potentially this one could be zero. Or this one could be zero. So if three X plus four is zero, then three X is a minus four and X is a minus four divided by three. So minus four thirds. If this is zero, x is equal to, we have the two over, x is equal to two, or x is equal to minus four thirds. Okay, so that was the first, first one we factored and solved. Then we had to move stuff around, look at that. <clears throat> okay, so now I want to do this x to the third. Minus 2x squared minus equals a minus x. So the first thing you might notice is this is not equal to zero. So we have to set one side equal to zero. So I would add the x over. So I'm going to write it over here. I think x to the third, x squared. And when I add this over, it's going to be x to the third. Now, <clears throat> We want to, we, we've done the first step, we've set it equal to zero. The next step is factoring this thing. So how do you factor this thing? What's the first thing you should do? <clears throat> and if you don't do this, it's gonna make your problem a lot more difficult. Everything has an X in it. I can take an X out, X squared minus two, X plus one is equal to zero. <laughs> And now I'm looking for two things that multiply to one and add to a minus two. So the two things, the magic numbers, are minus one and minus one. So I don't want, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time going over this, but I guess you do really quick. Multiply to one and minus two. Minus one and a minus one. And so we've done a few factorings, but this is factored into x minus 1, x minus 1. I can use that little shortcut. I'm going to employ that to save a little bit of time on here. If you split this middle term up, you should get the same thing if you do the box method. But I'm going to employ that little shortcut. Okay. So we're looking here, we have one, two, three things we're multiplying together. So we're looking here, the first option, and it's really important to put this thing. So a lot of people will take out this X and they will forget, forget about him, but he is a potential solution right there. X equals zero is a potential solution. If I plug in zero to this equation, I'm gonna get zero equals zero. If I plug it into this original equation, I get zero equals zero. One equals zero, and 
I could also have an x minus one equals zero. Would be equal to one. So you might notice. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later. But what this is called is it has a multiplicity of two. So there are it's happening twice at this thing. So one thing we can do. Uh, So for number two, we got two solutions, x equals a minus four thirds and x equals two. You might notice that that thing was a quadratic. Here we're getting three things for a cubic. So it like for the solution, there really are two solutions for this thing. But one of these solutions has a multiplicity of two. And it's kind of important to count because if you want to count things back up, we have one, two, three things is going to give us our cubic. So we're expecting three solutions out of this thing. We're only getting two. And part of that reason is because this thing is happening twice. OK. Oh, uh, let's go to four. This one for the function eight x squared minus eighteen x plus five. So this is our f of x. They want us to find the values of x for which f of x equals a minus four. So now they're giving us something with sort of function notation, but I know this is f of x. And I know this is the value for which they want me to find my f of x. So this is like I'm plugging in a minus 4 into this f of x. So if I have a minus 4, this is what the equation setup should look like based on our function definitions. So what do I have to do to solve this, to solve this four values of x, is what they're asking. <clears throat> In order to do that, I have to, the first step, ooh, I guess you could, you could try to factor this, but then it's not going to be equal to zero, and our zero product rule is not going to work. So definitely the first step you want to do <laughs> is set one side equal to zero. Because if you factor that thing, like th that work is pretty much all in vain, unless they ask you another very specific question. <laughs> uh, so you don't want to like waste a bunch of time doing a bunch of work you, you don't have to do, right? So first step, first, always remember, always remember, set one side equal to zero. What do I have to do to do that? I have to add four to both sides. So I want to add four to both sides. So I'm going to like move things around a little bit. I like to put my equation on the left side and x squared minus 18x plus 5 plus 4 plus 9 is going to be equal to this thing, which is 0. Now I have zeroed out one side. I know it doesn't really matter, but this is what I've done all, all kind of my life. Getting used to it. Equation on the left, 0 on the right. You don't have to do things that way, but that's the way I'm used to. So now we're thinking here, 8 times 9 is giving me, what, 72? I have three terms. I got to do the AC method. I believe the magic numbers are minus 6 and 9. So I do x squared. I do minus six x minus twelve x. Equal to zero. Factor by grouping, or you could do the box method. I can take out two x, and I'm going to leave left with four x minus three. I can take out minus three. I can be left with four x minus zero. 
So factoring this thing out, 4x minus 3 is 2x minus 2. Zero. And now this thing, step two is done, fully factored out. So step one, set one side equal to zero. Step two, factor it. Step three is the zero product rule. So either this first thing is going to be equal to zero, or the second thing over here is going to be equal to zero. If 4x minus 3 is equal to zero, 4x is 3, and x is 3 fourths. If 2x minus 3 is 0, 2x is equal to 3, and x is 3 halves. Okay. So this is the work. So I'm going to rewrite it. x equals minus, wait, not uh, x equals positive 3 quarters, and x equals 3 halves over here. This is what we found for our x's. Use this information to find two points on the graph of that function. So remember, our points look like x comma y. Function notation, they're going to look like f comma f of x. So we have two x values. That's where we're getting two points. Quarters. Sort of correlating y value. So what is our y value or our f of x value? That was the thing that they gave us right here to plug in in the, in the beginning. We're getting two points on our graph. Okay. Okay, so now moving on to the fifth one. Find the zeros of f. Okay. So what does the zero of f mean? If we wanted to write it like we did in the previous one, the zero of f would be when you're also known as the x-intercepts. Um, so this is what they're asking. They're asking us to set this entire equation equal to zero and to solve for the correlating x. So we want to solve for our zeros. We set this equation equal to zero. So our f of x is equal to zero. We look at this thing. The first step when you solve, <laughs> solve a polynomial is to set one side equal to zero. Boom, it's done already. So that that is the, this is kind of the ideal sort of scenario, right? You don't have to move things to the other side. It's already set equal to zero. The next thing is to factor this thing. <clears throat> if we factor this thing, what is what should we do first? If you don't do it, it's going to make life more difficult. Ooh, excuse me, minus 20 is equal to zero. X squared plus X, one X minus 20. So we want two things that multiply to minus 20 and add to one. So we are doing the AC method once again. So I'm thinking of these numbers. I believe four and five will do it. Four being a negative five being positive, so that it's a positive one. So I'm going to do this pretty quickly. I can use my little shortcut on this thing. So I can jump right to x minus four x plus five. I'm going to invoke that shortcut every time I can in these notes. If you don't see it, then that's fine. Like I'm not. Like, do some good work, and you will get graded accordingly, right? It's a lot more important to attempt these things and, and to, than to get every little aspect. And, and, and that's, you're still doing correct math, right? I can't count off for doing good, good, correct math. So. Don't be dismayed by it. So here we look. 
And then you might notice we start with a cubic. So we kind of expecting three things to come out of this. And so hopefully we get three different factors. I see the first thing here. This thing is fully factored. I did, did I say this? Hopefully I said it was fully factored, right? We're fully factored. We're on to step three of our, of our game. So we want to do the zero product rule. X minus one equals zero. X plus five equals zero. Zero right in here. We could divide zero by two. It's just going to give us x equals zero. So I kind of said it like we really don't even have to like worry about these like constant coefficients here, right? But if there is a variable, we do have to worry about it. It is going to give us a solution here. So that two is kind of negligible. The next thing we have x minus four equals zero. This when we add the four over is going to become positive. Here, when we subtract the five it's going to become negative. So I'm getting 0, 4, and 5. Ooh, negative 5. All right, that. Just so we're clear. What are my x-intercepts? So my x-intercepts occur, and I like I hope this is this vocabulary is just like you get it in a snap. X equals zero. So every time you see the intercept word, always think the other thing is gonna be zero. So I want to know where everywhere where my y was zero. That's the thing we just found. So this looks like x comma zero. This is the third one. So there are three x intercepts on this graph. What are the y-intercepts? So when we plug in, we actually already found it. <laughs> but if you didn't find it and you didn't know this and we didn't do all that work, one way we could find it is by plugging in zero to my x. So two times zero plus three times x squared plus three times zero because it is zero. The point here is the origin zero, zero. So you could plug it back into your equation if you hadn't done that work <clears throat> and coincidentally found the origin. Because usually it's not going to sync up unless it is the origin, right? Yeah. Okay. Bit more work. Let's get at it. <clears throat> but... That is pretty much, like, I think pretty much the, the concepts are down. We're just going to work through them a little bit more just to get you more comfortable with it. <clears throat> so they're going to kind of give you the same thing here. And if we have this thing. Figure out where it equals minus eight. So I believe we have what two more of these problems, and then we're gonna have one one word problem that uses the same principle. And I think you'll be able to get at it a little bit better knowing this stuff. So if we want to solve this. First steps first to solving a polynomial is we have to set one side equal to zero. So now I have three terms. I'm thinking about doing AC method with 28, and it has to add to 11. So I'm hoping I'll practice these things because I believe four and seven should give me it. Since this is a one in my A place, I can use my little short. 
Either. Well, hold on. Let me step back. This thing is fully factored, so I am done with step two. So now I can go on to step three. So either this thing is equal to zero, plus equal to zero, x equals zero, x equals zero. If that's the case, this is a minus four, or here, x is going to be. Okay, so use this information to find two points on the graph of the function. So again, we want to go x comma y or x comma f of x. So now I'm asking myself, what is my y value? That's the original thing they gave me. My f of x is a minus a. And I don't know, it's coming up. But if it helps you to like kind of think about this thing graphically. Uh, that one an easy one? No. Okay. Parabola, some sort of positive parabola. I think it looks more, well, uh, maybe draw it more into what it probably looks like. That's some sort of positive parabola here. Is value of minus eight. And so if I'm thinking about how many solutions this is going to give me for x, it should be giving me two solutions, which are a minus four and a minus seven. And so you'll notice these two points are minus seven, minus eight, and a minus four, minus eight. Are the two points I got there. It should look something like this. If it helps you to put a picture in your mind of what this thing's sort of looking like. A parabola has is going to turn, so we're going to end up crossing it probably twice. And again, this is coming up in the future. So kind of throwing it out there before we officially go over it. Okay. Let f of x equal 12x squared minus 11x plus 2. We want to solve this thing, and we want to solve this thing for the zeros of the function. Is equal to zero, or your function value is equal to zero. So knowing this vocabulary, knowing what the zeros of the function are, knowing that that is the y equals zero and it's not the x equals zero like a lot of people try to do right you have to plug in zero to the right thing equal to zero and solve this thing so first step to solving equation is we set one side equal to zero bam we are done so we already did one third of it. So let's do the other two thirds. So the next step is to factor. Uh, we wanna factor this thing. So pause the video, figure those things out. Weird. Minus three x. Zero. these, I'm taking out a three x. That's leaving me with x. Four x minus one. I'm taking out a minus two. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that should be a number two. I copied it down wrong. 
So, we're safe. I'm taking out two minus two. There we go. This is that no. And this should give me four x minus one. So make sure you write things and copy things down correctly. Uh, that happens to everyone. So see it quite a bit. It changes the problem you're working on, and then it makes it a lot harder to grade it and comparatively to other people's work. Uh, I try to be consistent with the way I grade. And when y'all do things like that, it's really hard. 4x minus 1. 3x minus 2. As is equal to 0. So we're factoring this thing. Factor by grouping. Or you could use the box method. We've done a few AC uh, factoring problems. Uh, and so here we are. We have our factors. This thing is completely factored. Now we're on to, we're done with step two. Now we're on to step three. So either this thing is zero or if this thing is zero, four X, we're going to add that one over. We're going to divide by four. Add that two over. We're going to divide by three. So I'm getting two solutions. X equals two thirds. And one fourth. Box them. Get a headache trying to find your solutions. And I'll probably grade it a little nicer. Now we're back to this question of x intercepts y intercepts. So let me let me re re copy this. X equals a quarter and x equals two. Here. The x intercept. Minus y equals zero. Y intercept is where my x is equal to zero. <clears throat> so if I want my x intercepts, those are the things I just found. If I want my y intercept, I have not found that yet. But this thing should be fairly simple to solve. Compared to what we just did, it should be fairly simple. Plugged in a zero, it's a bad out of two for my f value. So my y intercept here is zero comma two. And to be honest, I did a lot of work to find that. <laughs> if you're plugging in zero here, it disappears. If plugging in zero here, it disappears. Really, all you have to do is look at the constant if you figure that one out, right? So that one's not too hard. I don't expect a whole lot of work for that one, right? Okay, we got one more. I think you might like this one. It is putting some application use to this. We're going to lob a cannonball. It is fired from a cliff that is 260 feet above the ground. We have a height function S that is in feet of a cannonball as a function of time T in seconds. Can be modeled by this. So our T is the time. Our S is the height in feet. So we're loving this cannonball, shooting it up. It's coming down. When will a cannonball reach a height of 308 feet? So they're giving us this value of 308 feet. And so we really have to ask ourselves, is it a T or is it an S value? So if they're saying feet, S is in feet. So this S value. So we're plugging this into our S. So this is probably exactly what you're expecting. Actually, squared plus the feet. So we want to figure out when our cannonball is at 308 feet. Okay. So we want to solve a polynomial equation. What is the first step? The first step they told us is determine 
move everything over to the right side. God bless you. I don't know what to tell you. But not going to do that. We're going to subtract that 308. Two over there. I definitely did not do that in my head. Definitely used a calculator for it. So, uh, We're looking at 16, 64, and 48. And I'm just looking at this thing. I did step one where I set one side equal to zero. Now I'm looking onto my step two where I factor this thing. The first step to factoring is to find your GCF. So I think it's going to be a little headache. And a little headache. Probably pull out, I think you can pull out a minus 16 from everything. It's down quite a bit. That just becomes a T squared. This becomes. and this becomes a plus three. <clears throat> I'm looking for two things that multiply to what? Three? And really, I think there's only no probably. So this one, one of the things you can put down technically I can go straight to the sort of T minus one and T minus three. Those two fancy numbers I found. And I can invoke that shortcut. It is I am one right here. So it I am able to do it. So now we have either minus 16 is equal to zero. I don't think that's ever going to happen. Pretty sure those numbers are different. Three seconds. So, when will a cannonball reach a height of 308 feet? And I'm getting two different. And the short answer is yes, that's fine. Uh, so, I want to maybe talk a little bit about what's happening here. So, this is happening mostly in the first sort of quadrant. <clears throat> Since it's leading with a negative, this is actually going to be an inverted parabola. So again, we're going to go over this more in the future. But I'm just trying to give you a general sort of picture, maybe what this thing looks like. And I didn't draw my axis nearly long enough for my parabola today. But this is like a height of 260 is where they're saying they're going through. Um, the other thing is we wanted to go for it. And so if we're looking along here, this is the thing we just solved on to the on these things, but my time here is one. In my time over here, so it's reaching that height. We're lobbing our cannonball. It's going up, and it's going to come down. So the height of one is when it's going up, and the and the height. Ooh, no, sorry. The time of one is when it's going up, and the time of three is like when it's coming back down. So it's going to reach that height twice. So that is sort of like why we're getting two solutions for that thing. And it is okay. We should get two solutions, and it's going to hit that height twice. So this is the basics of sort of like what they call projectile motion. So that's what the title of this is. So they really love these like sort of projectile motion problems. Um, we will go more into these things, and we will go into more... We hadn't done it yet, but we'll go to more into finding how high did this thing go, right? That would be another question that will come up. Something to look forward to. When will the cannonball hit the ground? So I've drawn this thing. 
I feel like this is a prettier picture. I'm going to throw this one in my notes up here. So this is the sort of picture that's in your brain. How many solutions do you think we're going to get for hitting the ground? So we'll be here, right? When, when the height is zero is what they're talking about. So we started from two, 260 feet is probably another thing to, to realize. Um, and so how many solutions will we get for time for it to hit the ground? Uh, so there's a weird thing that's happening and we'll talk a little bit more about it when, when it comes up. We got one more sort of thing to solve for, so there's not a lot. Let's go for it. When will it hit the ground? So my function is plus 60 the height is a height of zero. So this is what the problem is asking. When when will it hit the ground is when my height is zero. They're telling me to set this equation equal to zero and solve it. So if I do that, I can pull out a GCF of a minus four. If I do that, I'm gonna be left with four T squared minus 16 T minus 65. To zero minus four, bring that down. I want to break this thing up. That is not a pretty number. I remember doing this, not a pretty number. I do four times 65. We want 260, and it's going to add to minus 16. There are a lot of factors. So maybe if we play this a little bit smarter and not harder, one, two, six is gonna be really far apart. 10, that's what I thought. And then if we do that, oh, it be minus 260, sorry. The sign should be negative. And if we do that, it might make it a little easier to add to minus 16 because it should be a minus 26. So these are not the prettiest numbers, but sometimes reality doesn't always give you the prettiest numbers. And we got to work with it. got to work with reality. It gives us t squared uh, plus And so we're looking at this thing here. We got this and this. And I don't know how much I want to keep on bringing this in minus four down, right? Because like in this previous one, this minus 16, it's a constant we took out. It's not going to contribute to our solution at all. So this thing, I think I'm just going to kind of ignore it from now on. It's not going to contribute to the solution. If you want to bring it down and at the end you tell me minus four can never be zero, then that's fine. But I'm not going to do it. Gonna save me a little bit of ink. Uh, so four t squared. I'm just grouping these two. I can pull out a two t. Plus five. Zero. Okay. So two t five. This is one. And two t minus. Zero. So I got my two factors. This, this thing is fully factored. I am done with step two of the game. Now I'm going to on to step three, the zero product rule. So I know either five is equal to zero. Zero is equal to five. Zero is So we're looking at this, we have this solution. 
we have this solution. Now, we have to go back and look at what the heck they're asking us. When will the cannonball hit the ground? We, hit, we set the equation equals zero. We solve for the times it will hit the ground. If your boss asks you when will the cannonball hit the ground and you tell them in negative seconds, this does not make a whole lot of sense. So this is a bit of an So we're expecting two solutions. We get two solutions, but one of them doesn't really work for what we're doing. And a bit of a reminder, we're getting a negative solution. Our model really should not expand beyond this over here, right? It should only be within the first quadrant here. And so since our model actually expands beyond what is, what is realistic, we're gonna get numbers that aren't realistic. Be a better thing to do, and maybe converting. Easier to see, like on this graph, like what is happening here. So this will be talking about. Okay, so at 6.5 seconds, this thing will hit the ground. So that is the final problem. We have done factoring. We have done lots of factoring. And now we're putting it to use by setting things equals, equal to numbers or to values and factoring and solving polynomial equations. And we put that to use with a projectile motion problem. So I will see you in class tomorrow, study hard for the test and get this stuff down and hope to see you soon.